Chair of Blueprint Mississippi, the Commissioner of Higher Education for the State of Mississippi, Dr. Hank Bounds. Well, thanks, Blake. So how do you introduce a person who is well known to everyone in the audience? I suppose I could talk about his success as a leader in business at FedEx, McCall Cellular, Netscape, and now Spread Networks, a company he helped establish in 2009. I could talk about his service on blue chip boards like Time Warner, FedEx, the Mayo Clinic, NQTEL, and Dick Clark Productions. I could talk about how he was called upon by former President George W. Bush to serve on the President's Intelligence Advisory Board and by Governor Barber to chair the Governor's Commission on Recovery and Renewal of Mississippi after Hurricane Katrina and the more recent Mississippi Broadband Collection, Coalition. Or I could talk about his many national, international, and Mississippi awards and honors, including most recently the prestigious Mississippi Medal of Service Award. These are all emblematic of the accomplishments of our keynote speaker today, but in my view, they aren't what he is really all about. In my mind, Jim Barksdale is really about making a meaningful difference in the future of our children. Jim and his wife, Donna, have not only talked the talk, but walk the walk, stepping up time and time again to make a meaningful difference, uh, most recently with a gift to the University of Mississippi for the creation of the Mississippi Principal Corps, which will change the way our state school's principals are trained, and through their sponsorship of the Schoolhouse to Statehouse project for getting parents more engaged with public schools in Mississippi. And the work of the Barksdale Reading Institute over the last decade has provided foundational strength. MEC has asked Jim Barksdale to speak today for a specific reason. In survey after survey after survey of its members, the main thing is education. And as Jim has said so many times, the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing. As we focus under this big top tent on so many election year issues, MEC wanted to make sure that it is clear to all who are running for office that the main thing is education. Please join me now in welcoming a man who has cast a huge shadow as an international leader in business, but who remains squarely committed to making a real difference in the future of our next generation. Please welcome Jim Barksdale. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. The last time I was here was uh, Right after Katrina, when uh, the governor had asked me to head the committee that was charged with de redeveloping the bottom 42 counties of the state, I must say it, it's a little more pleasant today than it was then. But uh, I congratulate Hobnob for putting this event on every year. I think it serves a great purpose. It gives us a chance to reflect on some of our goals and objectives, and this year in particular with the publication of the new uh, blueprint for Mississippi economic development. We've got some more things we can, we can talk about. Let me, let me just give you a couple of things from my background that would help in the discussion of this subject. I come from a business background. Three of the major companies that I had the great fortune and pleasure of being at, in the executive position not only created companies, they created industries and millions of jobs in the process. So I know something about creating jobs and economic opportunity. I don't profess to be an absolute expert, but I have learned a thing or two. At FedEx, the idea of overnight express delivery at the time when it was started in 1974 may not seem so now to some of you younger people, but at the time it was a big idea. It was a very big idea. But it had been right under the surface of transportation systems forever. Nobody else had really thought about doing it in a controlled network way. And Fred Smith came up with the idea, and today they employ over 300,000 people around the world. They serve cities from, from Brookhaven to Beijing with absolutely, positively overnight. And they have changed the world of transportation. And so what did we learn doing that? I was the chief operating officer for 10 years. Prior to that, I was the head of information systems and building some of the systems that tracked all these packages. And one thing I learned is 
quite often, great ideas are right under the surface of our feet. But nobody wants to change them. Nobody wants to make the change. Nobody wants to take the risk. Nobody wants to invest the money. Nobody really believes that they can make a difference. See, everybody wants progress, but nobody wants change. Change is hard. It's unpleasant. But oh, we love the world of progress. Then after FedEx and helping build that company, I was attracted out to Seattle to run another company called McCall Cellular in the early days of the cellular industry. When people said, well, it won't be but a couple of million people using cellular phones. Folks, they're over two billion today. They were slightly off. <laughs> we built that company, McCall, to be the largest cellular company in the world by the time we sold it to AT&T in 1994. And it became AT&T Wireless. And I was very proud of our efforts. Creating change, creating jobs, creating industries. All from ideas that were right under the surface. Steve Jobs in the recent book about him right before he died by Walter Isaacson said, we didn't do market research at Apple. Because people couldn't tell us what they wanted. We showed them what they wanted before they knew it. We showed them Air Express before they realized they needed Air Express. We showed them cellular telephony before they realized the advantage of nomadic telephone service. And then later at Netscape in the mid-90s to the end of the 90s, working in that company with an awful lot of great young people, all of whom were under the age of 16, we built a company that nobody thought could exist. The fastest delivery of software ever delivered in America. The fastest growing revenue company in the history of America. A product that could sell itself, collect the bill for it, and distribute itself over the same network, the internet. All products right under the surface, or as we used to say, we'd put a product up, a website or something, and if people hit on it, we'd call it a product. And if they didn't, we'd call it market research. <laughs> it was a wonderful way to find out what people wanted, all under the surface. And today, of course, we've seen the marvelous, enormous change that has been created in the world by the internet and internet services and products, an industry. Now, I'm not going to claim like Al Gore that I invented the Internet, but I do think we had a lot to do with it in the development of the browser, which made it where mere mortals could use the Internet, which is why the company succeeded. These businesses demonstrate to me this concept of the big idea, the big, hairy, bodacious idea, which are the ones we ought to work on. There's no point in working on little ideas. And there's a huge one right under our feet here in Mississippi in public education. What is it? A high school graduate makes a quarter of a million dollars more in their lifetime than a non-high school graduate. A college graduate makes a million dollars more in their, in their lifetime than a non-college graduate. If we could just increase the graduation rate of the state of Mississippi's high schools by 3%, 3%, and increase the number of college graduates per year in Mississippi students of 800 a year over their lifetime for each of those groups, for a 10-year group of students, that's $11 billion. indifference in earnings. And it's all back and forth. These three companies I mentioned to you, they were all network companies. What is that significant? Because in a network, the network is only valuable if there are other people on the other end. Imagine being the first telephone salesman. Who is the customer going to talk to? Well, the same thing was true with FedEx. 
You could pick up all the packages in the world from New York, but if you didn't, weren't going anywhere, you weren't going to get any packages. So by adding a node or a point on a network, you not only increase the value of the lane segment going to it, but also coming from it. What we learned at FedEx, we built these big computer models of how to forecast the Air Express buying power index. If we go into Virginia Beach, Virginia, I remember the day we opened Virginia Beach. Someday FedEx will reach to Virginia Beach. Pretty snappy, huh? As we opened the market like that, not only did it give the people from Virginia Beach the ability to ship by FedEx, it gave the people on the rest of the network around the country the ability to ship to Virginia Beach. So all of a sudden, a customer we may not be getting because that was his one destination point, now we'd get his business plus a little more. The same thing's true in an educated workforce. If you've got $11 billion of purchasing power, who are they going to buy from? You. It's the same principle Henry Ford discovered when he said if he paid a decent wage, what were the people going to do with the money? They were going to buy a Ford. It's a cycle. It's what Adam Smith called the invisible hand. It's the invisible hand of networks that no government and very few people can actually explain. It's why governments can't create jobs. You can't manage all the nodes of the network of 300 million people in America or 7 billion people now in the world. It's incomprehensible. But if you open it up and let it work, it can create enormous value. 3% more high school graduates and 800 more college graduates, $11 billion. By the way, the taxes on that would pay for this year's public education system in Mississippi. Imagine. It's a business that gives back to itself. Or like, and I know this may be a little off color, the old world's oldest profession. You got it, you sell it, you still got it. Such a business. I mean, this is opportunity. So how are we doing? A lot of people say, oh, we throw money at education, we don't get anything for it. You ever heard that? We, by the way, give less than every state in the nation except for three per child. So let's not kid ourselves. We're not throwing any money at anybody. And number two, we're doing great in some ways. To be specific, since 2005, and I want to get my numbers right, the effectiveness of public education. We have improved our NAEP, or the National Report Card, the National Assessment of Education Preparedness uh, numbers, dramatically. Since 2005, our fourth graders reading at or above basic, which is the score they have to get to if they're going to be at all successful later in life, later in school, it can predict the high school dropout rates, the teenage pregnancy rate, the number of people going to prison. It's the most vital early statistic you can get about a child. Fourth grade reading scores. Mississippi, fourth grade reading scores have grown eight times higher than they did from 98 to 2005. In other words, if you look at the NAEP scores, they just go along, rocking along, same score about every year, and in 05, they take a dramatic upward bend in the curve. Why? Well, I'll get to that in a second. Our NAEP scores since 05 have grown 75% higher than the national gain since 05. In other words, we're growing at 75% faster rate than the rest of the nation. Why? And for those people who say we don't get what we pay for, they just don't know what they're talking about. So let's talk about why these numbers are moving. By the way, the most significant progress in the last seven years have been for the children most at risk, poor and black. Their scores have been growing faster than the other scores, which is closing the gap which is something that nobody's really been able to do in this state for a hundred years. Why? These are the children most at risk and the ones, by the way, for which we have a lot or most of our early childhood development efforts. 
Just two states had a higher growth rate. I want to give them a shout out. They were Alabama and Maryland. So if you know anybody from Alabama, they can talk about their football team. They can also talk about the fourth grade reading scores. The reason these scores were increased are directly attributable to many, many things. We focused, focused, focused on early childhood reading through all kinds of ways, and the teachers got very focused on it. If a child can't read, it doesn't much matter what else you're trying to teach them. They can't learn science, they can't learn history, they can't learn math. By the way, our math scores are growing faster over the last few years. Now, I realize the last two years, as were reported in the paper yesterday, our reading scores and our math scores leveled out. The whole nation leveled out. It leveled out because funding leveled out and went down. We all understand the effects of a recession, but let's not think it has no effect on our school programs. So for those who say, well, show me the relationship, I just showed it to you. Go look at the charts. Now, in addition to focusing on early childhood reading and education, we created feedback loops. The Mississippi Curriculum Test II, which Hank Bounds worked very hard on, a lot of other people at Mississippi Department of Education, has created a marvelous mechanism for people to learn how their schools are doing. That combined with the results of the Mississippi uh, a legislative session, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the legislation that set up a new method of presenting this information called the Children's First Act. You can go on the internet, put your school district or your school in on msreportcard.com, and you can see how it compares against other school districts and schools in every category. How did they do in terms of their overall achievement score? Were they superior? Were they failing? Were they at risk of failure? How much money did they spend per child? Where did they get the money from? How many teachers they got? How many administrators? How do they rate against the rest of the state? What's the demographics, the percentage of white, black, Hispanic, Asian? These are the things you need to know now to be able to compare schools. For the next big question is, well, why does one school district or school do better than another one? And you go to msreportcard.com and you can see the differences. And it's amazing, and something we've never been able to see before as a general populace. Why does one school district or school do better than another one? Some other things we've done in the last seven years that have been very helpful, we've provided coaches, teachers, the BRI, Barksdale Reading Institute, provided new methods. We've implemented a new principal training core. We've put principals in certain schools to see the effectiveness of transformative principals on failing schools, and it's been phenomenal. One person can go to a failing school, a principal that's really a transformative go-getter, and can make a huge difference. And we can show that to you. As big a difference as if you made it a charter school. So, even though we slowed down a couple of, uh, the last couple of years, I'm convinced that we keep pushing this thing, we're going to see the curve come right back up on these reading scores and math scores without a question. But we still need to stay after it. The point is it can be done because it is being done. The other thing you have to watch in worrying about schools is efficiency. What I've been talking about up to now is effectiveness. We're effective because we're raising our reading scores or we're raising our attendance rates or we're raising our graduation rates. The question is, a lot of people, how efficient are we? What do we get for our money? I've told people when I used to go visit FedEx stations around the world, you get out there at 5.30 in the morning, that's the only time you're going to get all the couriers and talk to them and try to get them fired up and what's going on in the business. And then afterwards you meet with the manager and invariably the young manager of the station would say, now Mr. Barksdale, what do you want? You want lower cost or better service? I don't know why they always thought that was such a great question. You want lower cost or you want better service? With your schools, you want better grades or you want lower cost? The answer is we want both. That's why we got you, I would say to the young manager. That's what a manager does. Any fool can do anything with unlimited resources. 
The trick is how do you manage the resources you got? And that's our goal, that's our task, that's our major issue right now. So we've got to be more efficient. And there are many things we can do. But one of the things is let's go find out why one school district does better than another when they got the same demographics. Demographics is a code word for black and white. What percentage of the children are black? What percentage of the children, it tells you, on free and reduced lunch? That's a code word for poor, all right? And so people say, well, that's a poor district. That's why they don't do as well as this rich district. But then you say, wait a minute. Let me show you another district that's got the same percentage of children in poverty or the same percentage of African-American children. And this district does well, and that one doesn't. And by the way, this one doing poorly might spend more money per child. How'd that happen? You see, that one factor refutes all these arguments about that poor black children can't learn. Of course they can. Any child can learn. And the sooner we face up to that, the sooner we'll get on with our business. All you have to do is look at MS report card and pull up districts that are comparable. You know, the same number of students the same demographics, and see who does better. And then you ask yourself, why? Why would one district or school do better than another one? And what's the answer? It's better managed. It's got better people. It's the same as a business. You build a business out of A players, you're going to do better in the business that builds a business out of C players. I guarantee you, if you got the same rough product set, we're all trying to teach the same things, math, science, English. Better people, better teachers, better principals, better superintendents. So that's why Building Blocks is talking about some of the things that we need to do in their four objectives that, they're, that are laid out, and I will end with that. First, children need to be ready to learn when they hit kindergarten. Reading your report, reading the full write-up of the report. By the way, it's got all the references for all the numbers and stuff that I'm quoting. All the, uh, the scholars that have represented these things over the past. Early childhood, let's build a quality early childhood program. Quality is also a word, code word for management. Quality management. It's how we won the National uh, Quality Service Award at FedEx, the first service company to win the Malcolm Baldridge Award, because we just focused every day. This is a mistake we made yesterday, we're going to fix it today. What the Japanese call Kaizen, continuous improvement every day little things. That's what quality management's about. That's what A management does. We need to implement a quality management system for early childhood so that we run it as one homogeneous group instead of several very well-intentioned, well-done uh, things like blueprint and success by five and things of that nature. Let's put them all under an umbrella and that's what we're proposing with the blueprint proposal. The second thing, better teachers. The most important thing in a child's education, the biggest differentiator, and you think back over your childhood, are the teachers you have. You let a child go through three bad teachers in a row, that child is doomed. Now, by the way, when I talk about teachers, I always have to say, of course, we have some of the most wonderful, dedicated, hardest working teachers in the world right here in Mississippi. But we also have some people who are not quite as good, who are average. Let's just stop there. The problem is a child in poverty needs an A teacher, not an average teacher. That's the dichotomy. That's the dilemma. That's the terrible business problem, if you want to look at it that way. How do you get great teachers to work in the areas that have the biggest problems? Our recommendation there is Teach for America. Teach for America has now got 175 freshman teach, uh, first year teachers here, 350 in total in Mississippi and the Delta and a couple other places. They have been a godsend. These are young people that come out of 500 colleges around the country. They come in here all fired up. They go to Delta State for their training program, the largest Teach for America training program site in America. 
and they hit those classrooms. The state of Tennessee just reported its second annual survey, the best trained teachers in the state of Tennessee of all the 42 institutions that train teachers in Tennessee, Teach for America. Teach for America. So don't tell me that they're not well trained, they don't do well in the classroom, we've got too many stats that show they do. They're now principals of some of our schools. They're on a couple of our school boards. They stay longer than the first year freshman teachers that come out of our schools of ed. 70% of whom don't last the first two years. Teach for America, it's 95% and many of them stay a third and a fourth year. We want $12 million from the state budget, just get specific, set aside for Teach for America. We might need two more to help us with a prior commitment we didn't live up to last year. $12 million, write that down. We do not want that deducted from the MAPE funding. All right? Let's don't go through this thing again like we did with that revenue from taxes on gambling that all is supposed to go to the schools. Where'd that money go? $12 million. Teach for America. Great opportunity. Other things were raising the entry and the certification exit for teachers. A higher score getting into the School of Ed and a higher score to get certified. A big effort, very important. We think that's going to be helpful in raising the bar for teachers going into our schools. Also, teachers have to be more trained in subject matter. Teachers pass the third grade, it's more important they know the subject matter than the pedagogy of teaching a class. That's what Teach for America proves more than anything. The other thing we're proposing in the blueprint that's a very big step is merit pay. Now, we want it to be done correctly and fairly. Merit pay is the way to get more money to the teachers who perform better, reward them for their efforts, and let's stick to a very clear, simple thing. How do the children do from the beginning of the school year to the end of the school year? Did they move a one-year clip in one year? We've got a lot of wonderful people in classroom, but when you look at that number, they don't move. Everybody had a great time. How did they do in the year? Now, there are many other factors, and we understand that it has to be done appropriately, but I think merit pay is long overdue and would be a great push for this state to differentiate itself from others. That's also a recommendation, recommendation of Blueprint. And the last recommendation is better leadership. We said, what's the difference between districts? It's leadership. There are 15,000 15, school districts in America. 165 of them have elected superintendents. 15,000. 65 of those 165 are here in Mississippi. There are only two other states that elect superintendents, Florida and Alabama. Now, how did that happen? Here's the problem. There are so many great elected superintendents in this state, you can't count them hardly. They do great work, and I can tell you the districts they're in. But in many smaller districts, you don't have a qualified person to be elected superintendent. Now, come on. Some of these districts only have one school. I'm not going to get into consolidation. We know how hard that is. But we do think by 2015, we should stop having elected superintendents. Those who have been elected prior to that get to stay in office. And by the way, if their school board thinks they're the best qualified candidate, they can appoint them to be the superintendent. But imagine Mayo Flint running AT&T where everybody that got the job was elected. <coughs> Nothing wrong with elections for all you politicians. <laughs> you couldn't run a business more than a week. You certainly want the input. At FedEx, we allowed every manager, before you could actually be promoted, you had to have a passing grade by your peers and by your subordinates and your coworkers. Very unusual. But that still didn't mean they got to elect the manager. That's, so my point is, let's change from elected to appointed superintendents. Those who are in the office get to stay in the office. But let's change this. It's a highly, it's a highly a, a, a 
prof a trained profession that needs to have certain skill sets that may not be available in that district. So please, when we're asking for things for business, for the, uh, for the uh, building blocks, uh, I mean for the uh, blueprint plan, let's ask for that. It's a hard vote. I know it's a hard vote. People have talked about it in the past. Nobody likes change. Everybody likes progress. Well, here's a chance to change something. Doesn't cost a dime. So what we've covered, the $11 billion opportunity right under our feet, let's get with it. We can do it because we are doing it. I've shown you the scores. They're going up faster than scores in the rest of the nation. And to keep on improving, let's follow the building blocks, uh, uh, the, the blueprint plan that's laid out. It's on your table, a summary of it. But the big plan, read it, learn what it says. Early childhood, teacher quality, and leadership quality. Obviously, we need to continue to fund at MAPES levels. You won't always hear that. I know Haley and others say, well, people who say you don't care about children if you're not willing to spend more money, I have never said that. Everybody cares about children. What I've said is that money is essential, it's just not sufficient. You have to do all these other things with management and how you run the schools and all of that to make them really move forward. If you just did throw money at it, you're not going to move the needles. There are plenty of schools around the country who spend a lot more money and don't get any better results. So we do plan to continue to push for MAPE funding. There are many organizations you can join. I ask you to take a look at the parents' campaign, join that, become a member of that, and you learn a lot every week, email about what's going on with schools around the state, donors choose online, donorschoose.com. You can give money to an individual school or teacher for some project they need. It's a wonderful feeling of giving to some of these areas, schools in your district or not, schools in our state or not, donors choose. It's a wonderful program. Now, I hope I've made myself clear. There's a great opportunity. It's up to all of us to see that it's accomplished. It will be worth your while, I promise you. Have faith in these little children. They'll make you proud. Thank you.